these stories of working at home and all that stuff are probably stories. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, there is a recent study of 10,000 uh, person IT company. Mm. And they measured the hours spent by the people at work. Mm -hmm. The output. Mm -hmm. So people's outputs have remained the same, but their working hours have gone from five to seven. So they have like office may five hours effective working at the time with all the breaks and uh, social social yeah. activities they were doing. That five has gone to seven, including mostly after hours, not during the daytime. Yeah. Output is still the same. So they're saying productivity is down by 25 to 30 percent basically. Oh, is that right? Well, output by number of hours. Output divided by number of hours. Come yeah. Well, I don't know much. My uh, both my daughters are here, and well, one has gone back just a week back. I I, I try to and, uh, agree with that. You because, won't believe. Uh, uh, well, they were well. Both of them were working from home. One is in the U.S. and one is uh, in Canada, and they started their work at like seven in the evening and were on till about four in the morning. Yeah. But they were themselves saying that, you see, they, they, they would get up around one o'clock or something like that. But then would laptop as he cheese that they were saying that we are putting in a bloody 10 hour day instead of putting in an eight hour day, which we used to when we were working. So. Uh, should we start the X ray video, sir? Uh, girl, sir? Why don't we start uh, actually? Uh, yeah. We are on time, and yeah. uh, if you've got people around, so we can start. Yes, yes. And Tapas, I think you'll delete this initial conversation out of it, right? Yeah, right, sir. <laughs> actually, uh, I'm just going to start with the X ray video. Uh, yeah. Then we'll proceed further. Hi, KD. Hi, uh, Anup, sir. How are you? Fine, how are you? I can see your pagdi only. Oh, yeah, there you are. Right. Now I can see your full face. <laughs> Hello, Kapil ji, how are you? And hi, Priyank, how are you? Good, sir. Very good, sir. How are you? All good, all good. Okay, let's start. So, yeah, thank you. Indian Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, ISHRI, stand tall in the Indian industry with over 10,000 professionals as members and almost an equal number of student members. Founded in 1981 and headquartered in Delhi, we operate from chapters and sub-chapters spread all over India, bringing our entire industry together. Individuals become members of our society according to their professional and academic standings. Our roadmap of the future looks very bright with thousands of new members joining this technical society every year and bringing in a fresh outlook to our industry intelligence. ISHRE disseminates knowledge through its technical committees which consists of some of the best minds of our industry. It publishes technical books, newsletters and a prestigious journal distributing the wealth of knowledge to all its members. Working with government departments, ISHRE helps formalize industry codes and standards. ISHRE promotes research by offering financial support to student members to carry out groundbreaking work in technology, systems and processes. Our educational wing, ISHRE Institute of Excellence, organizes training programs and workshops to help members enhance their skill sets. Our specially designed certification programs under ICP, that is ISHRE Certified Professional, empower professionals to always be in step with the prevailing technology. 
Specially designed courses for technicians are offered to meet the ever-increasing demand for a skilled workforce. ISHRE organizes exhibitions, conferences, panel discussions and product presentations throughout the country. We organize the industry's largest international exposition in South Asia, Acrix India. To showcase the cutting-edge technology, innovation and provide a platform for closer interactions amongst the decision makers in the industry. The Acrex exhibition is now growing from HVAC and R show into BFA, Build Fair Alliance. This brings together several allied shows connected with the building services industry all at one location. Our chapters organize several other popular events like Acriconf in Delhi, Raycon in Kolkata, Symposia in Mumbai, Techfest in Goa, and many more. We are committed to provide training and career guidance to our student members through seminars, lectures, quiz contests, and site visits. A Quest a prestigious quiz competition organized by ISHRE to catalyze the transformation of the budding engineering professionals. ISHRE provides a platform to potential employers to select student members for careers in HVAC and our industry at the ISHRE Job Junction. Young minds are made aware of the need for saving power, clean air and sustainability. The K-12 initiative of ISHRE focuses attention on school students' development to inculcate a scientific fervor and help develop them into responsible citizens. Speedy information is imperative to keep moving forward in this hyper-connected digital age. Searcher A specifically designed search engine is now available which allows access to a well-catalogued database on HVACR and building services industry with just a few clicks. ISHRE cooperates with various national and international bodies, industry, governments, academia, think tanks to promote the concept of sustainability, environmental protection and energy efficiency and conservation to enter and explore the universe of the Indian HVACR industry. Log on to ishray.in that unfolds a panorama of information. Let us engineer a sustainable future together through Ishray. This is the few slides of LP Roflex, our uh, world partner of DCI for this year, 2021 and 2022. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, uh, all the attendees, all the panelists, all the seniors, uh, topmost senior present over here and uh, uh, speaker for the day. Thank you very much for joining this session. And uh, as we know that uh, Delhi Chapter of Israel is celebrating World Environment Week. Uh, on this occasion, we are conducting five consecutive programs, one and one after. And this is the just the start uh, of this uh, week. Uh, with uh, uh, headings uh, that is understanding refrigerants basics, regulations, safety and advancement. And uh, uh, that will be covered by Mr. Kapil Singhal, the expert speaker on this topic. Yes, this program is supported by SRA India chapter and initiated by Delhi chapter of SRA. And th this uh, could not be happened without the support of uh, annual partner of Delhi chapter of SRA, that is of course the gold partner ALP of Lex and other annual partner is standard refrigeration, advanced walls, fluke, 
Lube Industry, Lord Insulation, and membership sponsor, a Aircon Engineers. So uh, now I request uh, Mr. Priyang Garg, the Secretary of the Lee Chapter of Israel, to proceed this program. And uh, I request all the attendees, all the participants, if you have any queries, please uh, put your question in Q&A box or uh, uh, you want uh, to interact. If you, then uh, you can raise your hand. We will allow you to speak at the time of question and answer segment at the end of this presentation. So again, I request Mr. Garg to proceed further. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. Uh, thank you, and thank you first to everybody who's here. Uh, very, very delighted to see 40 attendees to listen to Mr. Kapil Singhal. And um, to start off the, our uh, uh, effort to spread the awareness about the World Environment Day, which is coming up on the 5th of June, uh, the 47th. And uh, Mr. Anu Bilani will talk about this. So this is our first program for the week. And uh, just to introduce our... Uh, eminent uh, speaker, Mr. Balani, who is um, who's a stalwart in the uh, northern region and all over the country for the uh, air conditioning industry. Mr. Balani is a mechanical engineer with over 40 years of experience in the HVAC industry. He started his career with utility engineers. He's active uh, in various societies. He was president of the Delhi chapter of Israel in 2003, regional director 2004 and 2008, treasurer national at 2006. Presently, he is a vice president elect North and chair for REFCO 2021. He also serves the society in capacities for organizations such as uh, for various ACREXs as well as ACRECONF, both of which are international exhibitions and conferences on air conditioning and refrigeration. He was the president of Asher India chapter in 2010, chair membership promotion, chair research promotion, and has been recipient of the Asher Presidential Award of Excellence and the Red Ribbon Award. On the professional front, he has headed various companies like a business head for North for Rollerstar, Chief Operating Officer, Zico Aircon, Vice President and Head of Operations for Air Climate Division, Flagports India. And currently he's co-owner for Kani Marketing Private Limited. Kani represent um, international companies in India which do not have their own presence in India. Um, currently they are representing Price Industries from Canada for VIV diffusers, Thermofuser, Nihon Spindle, Malaysia Cooling Towers, uh, sorry, Nihon Spindle from Malaysia making cooling towers and uh, Fabric Air for Fabric Ducts. And I worked, I had the uh, good fortune to work with him on uh, various uh, uh, efforts in the society. And we are very pleased to have him uh, kick off our uh, Environment Week celebrations and uh, efforts with uh, his uh, few words of wisdom. Lani, sir, back over to you. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, okay. sir. Thank you. Thank you, Priyank. And thank you, Lili Chat Proveshre. Thanks, KD Singh, to have given me this opportunity to do a kickoff for the Environment uh, Week. And uh, welcome all of you and a great good evening. I hope you're all safe in uh, whatever environment you are, home, office, wherever you are. And uh, Stay safe, please. Delhi, though, is going down in their numbers. And uh, hopefully, we should be back to our old 100 and 200 uh, numbers in the next few days, I guess. But uh, that's what it is. Uh, coming back to the environment, uh, like uh, we all say, environment. the Environment Day is on 5th of June. And it's a day taken up by the world, call it as the Environment Day. And Ishre has taken up this task of uh, Environment Week. And Ishre at uh, all chapters across the country are celebrating this Environment Week with different programs. Most of the programs related to the environment. So like our national president got its theme, of uh, the luxury, he's got a luxury for make, planting a thousand trees in this one week. So let's all aim towards that and have him achieve his luxury and become an eco warrior for our national president. You know, I was in these 
last few days, there have been a lot of uh, flyers room flying around on WhatsApp groups. And there was a flyer which one of the chapters sent of a theme. And I really liked that theme. The theme was, and I'll say that right now, the theme was, dear human, if you don't destroy me, I will give you shelter, food, water, and oxygen. Great theme for the Environment Day. And it, is, it talks a lot on the reality of uh, what we all should be aiming at going towards. You know, the ecosystem loss is depriving us of a lot of carbon sinks, such as forests, lands, which we need the most at this time. The global environment, greenhouse uh, emissions have risen in the last three years substantially, like unbelievably, to tell you honestly. And I was reading it somewhere, the emergence of COVID-19 has reminded us of how disastrous the consequence of ecosystem loss can be. So it is a timely coincidence that the UN has decided to call it a UN dedicated to environment restoration week. So we all together have to reach there and look at this environment week as not for, you know, as a week or, you know, make it as our, should I say, a, a way of life. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot on it because mainly it is a couple who has to talk and it is his day today. I, uh, you know, I was thinking when I was told that you have to talk for a couple minutes and I said that I'm going to say some things which I would request all of you to make a note of and request you that in your hearts and in your practice from here onwards, you should, I guess, follow them. And I'm going to say that and I'm going to start now. I'm going to say that nurture the nature for a better future and pledge to do the following eight things. And I'm calling these eight things, and I'm going to name them, starting with one, reimagine, restore, recreate. Second is conserve water. Third is plant a tree. And by plant a tree, I don't mean plant a tree in this week. I'm pretty sure most of you are in an apartment building or in a house or in an office. Try to make your office as green as possible. Make your house as green as possible. Educate people. By educate people, I don't mean educate kind of educate. You see, we being in this industry, in the HVAC industry, are one of those lucky ones who know what an environment is on how to protect the environment. So I would request that we should educate people how to protect the environment. Then we should shop wisely. By shop wisely means go in for energy efficient things. Go shop things where you think that you are not destroying the environment but protecting the environment. We should conserve electricity, which is the standard. We should build sustainably. Then we should, all of us, should pledge today that we will be volunteers in spreading these, this message. This is the most important thing that we have to do. We have to spread this message across being this environment week, not only during the week, but down the line so that this message makes the change and we get somewhere. Things are like, I've been reading like, things in which are the global warming. There are so many things which are really, you know, scare the hell out of you sometimes when, uh, when you see that uh, the global warming is happening and the temperatures, they're saying that 1.5 degrees temperature is going to go up in the next 10 years. Like, you know, these things really scare us all. So I'm going to leave you with this. No long speeches, no nothing. Again, urge that let's pledge and do these eight things and surely we will take care of our nature. Thank you all and thank you. Thank you, Arugi. Thank you for those very uh, 
succinct and uh, actionable uh, ideas to actually bring some changes in our life. Uh, I hope some of it and spread the word. Um, and we also have to kick off the week some thoughts for uh, uh, young kids on what they understand about the environment. Tapas, do you have the video? Yes, sir. Should I play this? Yeah, please go. Oh, thank you. This is uh, thoughts from our little ones on what they think about the environment. We thought, let's start with the youngest minds. about the conservation and the preservation of the environment. June 5th was declared as World Environment Day by the UN General Assembly at the Stockholm Conference on Human Environment 1972. The first WED was celebrated in 1974 in Spokane, USA. Our Environment Environment provides us with sustaining resources and it is essential to protect it and preserve it. It is the home for many living species and maintains the balance in the ecosystem. There are many threats to our environment such as deforestation, pollution and many others. And this leads to global warming which not only affects us but all living beings around us. The emergence of COVID-19 has also shown just how disastrous the ecosystem loss can be. With this big and challenging picture, the WAD focusing on the ecosystem's restoration and, the, and its theme is Reimagine, Recreate, Restore. To prevent our earth from these damages, we should have to follow some ways. Planting trees, soil conservation, water conservation, waste management. Hence, the goal is to reduce carbon footprint by using maximum use of renewable energy to prevent further global warming. Thank you. That was uh, that sorry. was great, amazing. Yeah, amazing. Oh, really good. Our little ones. They can uh, give us the run for our money, sir. Right, Anupji? That kid, that kid was really good. Whoever's yeah. daughter it was or some student from some one of our schools, yeah. she did a good job. That's right. Amazing job. And, uh, I, you know, you know, I felt, I felt she, she, she said a few of my eight things. And I was really... yeah, the video was recorded first. So maybe you stole from her is what I should say. I was, I was very, I was very, I said, wow, a kid and me thinking on same grounds. <laughs> Now, Kapilji has a, a different act to follow to be as cute as the little one who just spoke. But I would, uh, I'm sure he has a lot of uh, very interesting information and insights for her. If I may take the, uh, have the privilege of introducing him. Um, Mr. Kapil Singhal is a mechanical engineer and hosts a postgraduate diploma in business administration. He has an overall experience of 22 years in uh, VAC and R industry. He's an active member of Ishre and Ashre. He's also a member of the Refrigerants Technical Committee of Ishre and Ashre. He has published papers in various industry journals and magazines. He's managing director of BP Ref Pool, which is into manufacturing and distribution of specialty products for HVACNR service tool and chemicals. Recently, BP Ref Pool has been focusing on innovations around refrigeration emission reduction to advanced recovery, leak detection, and monitoring. And um, today we have him talking about understanding refrigerants basics, regulation, safety, and advancements. And um, with his expertise in the space and his uh, long experience in the industry, uh, we, we are surely going to have a fabulous and uh, amazing session, interesting session learning from him. So 
So uh, without further ado, I hand it over to Kapil ji and uh, thank you for your time, Kapil ji. And now we have 55 people listening very intently to what you are able to share with us today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Priyank. And, uh, um, you know, this Environment Week is something which is a very a timely uh, for us to talk about refrigerants. So let me just uh, share the slides and continue to. Yeah. So probably my perspective of Environment Week or Environment Day uh, is, um, uh, you know, when I personally, uh, you know, evaluate what I did last year uh, and what I'm going to do in the coming year uh, about environment, what habits, what uh, uh, products or, you know, how um, I personally can contribute because each one of us can significantly contribute uh, towards the environment and be part of the HVAC and our industry um, with the, you know, one of the largest uh, consumer of uh, energy. So we play a very, very significant role. So all of us uh, need to be, you know, always thinking of environment uh, as every day. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Delhi chapter of uh, Ishre for uh, inviting me to talk about uh, the basics uh, or, uh, you know, uh, the regulation, safety and advancement of refrigerants. So I'll try to cover uh, uh, key main points uh, because, uh, these are, uh, you know, four different topics <laughs> for a refrigerant, uh, but uh, I'll try to cover uh, so that we cover, uh, you know, at least a glimpse of all of uh, these in the subsequent chart. So, you know, when we start off uh, with the basics of refrigerants, uh, we should actually look back in the history and learn from uh, the history and then uh, see how the refrigerants evolve. So, um, Refrigerants uh, are not new, you know, they probably started in 1830s with uh, either uh, being used as refrigerant and then air, ammonia, water, carbon dioxide, um, even hydrocarbons were used in uh, 1920s. So all these refrigerants were used uh, for uh, various uh, applications and uh, probably uh, since the overall refrigeration and air conditioning industry uh, was trying to innovate and uh, evolve. Uh, so any substance which was giving uh, a cooling uh, was tried out and uh, some of it commercially, some of uh, them are still uh, commonly used. Uh, but uh, till 1920s, the common refrigerants which were uh, most common those days were ammonia, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrocarbons, methyl chloride, and water. Now, these refrigerants, you know, some of it we know uh, are uh, still common today, uh, including ammonia, carbon dioxide, and hydrocarbons. Um, so there were certain challenges, like, you know, we wanted a refrigerant which should be non-flammable, should have good stability so that it lasts over the period of the life of the system, uh, low toxicity, and should have an atmospheric boiling point of minus 40 to 0 degrees centigrade. Now, when I talk about this uh, boiling point of minus 40 to 0 degrees centigrade, this is what we're talking from 1930s perspective. At that point in time, these were the four consideration where this boiling point was coming from precisely, uh, you know, air conditioning application perspective. These days, we also have higher boiling uh, refrigerants which are used for chillers and certain applications. But yes, uh, this was majorly coming from medium temperature refrigeration or uh, the air conditioning application uh, so that we have a favorable uh, pressures uh, along with it. Now, when we talk of refrigerants, uh, we know there were a number of refrigerants which were used. And uh, in 1930s, a new generation of refrigerants came in which were fluorinated. So uh, when they were fluorinated, uh, they were classified as chlorofluorocarbons, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or hydrofluorocarbons. Now with chlorine, fluorine, and hydrogen, they make a very uh, good mix and provide a very balanced uh, performance. 
but along with that you know these were very good in addressing all these concerns of uh, flammability stability toxicity and atmospheric uh, boiling point but the challenge came in was the environment which was not listed at that point in time because we were not knowing about uh, the environmental challenges so if we need to you know understand the refrigerants in slightly detail you know how to choose or uh, you know uh, pick a refrigerant uh, probably uh, we need to see this uh, triangle uh, wherein on the top is the hydrogen on the left side is chlorine and on the right side is fluorine now if we go towards the left side which is chlorine uh, we intend to increase the ozone depletion potential we are going to talk about the ozone depletion potential but uh, chlorine per se adds to or contributes to the ozone depletion um, and it also tries to raise the boiling point and that time uh, the boiling point uh, requirement was uh, zero degrees centigrade. We want we do, we never wanted more than a zero degrees centigrade boiling point refrigerants. Uh, fluorine uh, is something which is giving a very good stability. Now it gives a stability to the molecule. It increases the atmospheric life. Once it increases the atmospheric life, it increases the global warming potential because it lasts longer in the environment. So it contributes more to the global warming and it reduces the toxicity, uh, which is a good part about it. Now, hydrogen, if we go on to the, towards the top, uh, you know, it, hydrogen, as we know, is flammable and uh, increased amount of hydrogen in the molecule increases the flammability and it decreases the atmospheric life. So finding a balance between these is something which is a challenging stuff because, you know, those days when we were using CFCs, we were at this line, uh, nowadays, we use HFCs or HCFCs, so we are somewhere here or here, uh, but again, atmospheric life is something uh, where uh, we want to further reduce because uh, even today, uh, most of the uh, refrigerants, which is 134A or 410A or uh, other HFCs are something which are being questioned because we need to further uh, bring down the global warming potential so that they are more efficient and have lower uh, carbon footprint on, on the overall system. Uh, now, when we talk of the uh, environmental properties, I was talking about the ODP. So there are two main things uh, which are important from uh, the environmental properties of the refrigerant. One is the ozone depletion. So any molecule which has chlorine uh, into it, and uh, if the atmospheric life is such that it reaches the uh, ozone layer, then it depletes the ozone layer. Now, the potential of a molecule to deplete the ozone layer as compared to CFC-11 over a period of 100 years is called the ODP of that molecule. Now, say for example, CFC-11 was one, CFC-12 was one, the HCFC where hydrogen is added and hydrogen reduces the atmospheric life as we uh, learned earlier. So with the hyd additional hydrogen HCFC, 22, the atmospheric life come down from say hundreds of years to uh, 10, 20 years. So the global warming potential come down from one to say 0 0.055. So a very low as compared to uh, what we are replacing, but it is still because 22 is used a lot. So that is still uh, what we need to phase out and uh, come out with the uh, alternatives. Now, Monterey Protocol, India signed Monterey Protocol and we are party to it and we have already phased out CFCs. We are on verge of, uh, you know, phasing out HCFCs. It's mainly uh, in Indian industry. There are two main, uh, from a refrigerant perspective, there are two main molecules which are used, which are still uh, ozone depleting is R22 or HCFC22 and R123 or HCFC123. Uh, These are the most two common. Uh, there are some small, small, small others, but they are not uh, much in numbers. Uh, global warming is the another environmental uh, treaty or uh, effect where we need to work because all these refrigerants contribute to global warming or not, if not all, then most of the refrigerants which we are talking today or using today uh, contribute to global warming. Now, as we talked about ODP, similar is GWP. Now, global warming, the major contributor of the global warming is carbon dioxide. So the baseline used is uh, carbon dioxide in terms of uh, GWP. So global warming potential is the potential of a molecule to contribute to global warming as compared to carbon dioxide over a period of 100 years. 
Now, when it, it is again over a period of 100 years, means any lower atmospheric life gives a positive uh, thing to the molecule because the uh, global warming potential is going to come down. And global warming potential is uh, very, very high of some of the molecules, uh, including uh, the refrigerants, which are commonly used in India, which is uh, 23, uh, which is used in minus 80 degree temperature application or uh, 404A, which is used uh, in minus uh, uh, 20, minus uh, 30 type of temperature applications, where the global warming potential is like 4,000 or for 23, it was like 11,700 or something. So very, very high global warming potentials. Even uh, the global warming potential of uh, uh, 134A is 1300 or 1430 as per two different calculations. So that is also, you know, uh, 1,300 times more damaging to global warming as compared to carbon dioxide on an equal mass uh, basis. Now, since we knew uh, these refrigerants are global warming, so we need to definitely come up with uh, some environmental treaty. So Kigali Amendment was signed in the Montreal Protocol, uh, wherein uh, it was agreed that we will phase down, not phase out, phase down uh, these uh, molecules which have global warming and which are, uh, you know, used in our applications as refrigerants. Now, if we talk of ozone depletion, you know, when the molecule leaves the uh, system or uh, leaves the air conditioning appliance or refrigerator, then only it will contribute to the environment because then it uh, goes to the ozone layer and it depletes the ozone layer. Whereas in case of global warming, it is not uh, when it leaves. Definitely, uh, once it leaks out from the system, when it leaves the system, it is going to create, uh, you know, a contribute to global warming, which is a direct contribution to the global warming. Uh, even when it is running in the system, uh, the system is consuming power. And that power is something which is uh, contributing to, again, global warming, which can be an indirect uh, contribution. So when we talk of a system overall, including the direct emissions and indirect emissions uh, of a system with a refrigerant into it, we call it as TEWI, which is total equivalent warming impact, direct and indirect both put together over a life of that uh, system. Uh, we calculate and we find out the TEWI. This was used largely to evaluate different refrigerant for different applications because a molecule uh, may have a lower global warming potential, but if the energy consumption is higher, probably it is not going to contribute much because uh, we are going to lose out because of the energy. Uh, then when we were talking about TEWI, the another aspect came in uh, that you know, if we build the system which is too complex or uses uh, too much energy to make the system and even at the end of life uh, creates too much penalty on the environment uh, at the end of the life, then we need to also cater to both these aspects of uh, bringing the system to life and end of life. So if we put together a cradle to grave, you know, complete life cycle, then we call it as life cycle climate performance, or sometimes it is also called as LCCOP, uh, life cycle uh, climate performance. So this is something which is now uh, very uh, rigorously used for almost all applications to evaluate uh, what would be the suitable refrigerant for that uh, specific uh, application. So TWI, LCCP or LCCOP is something which is very common and uh, uh, we should always look for those for uh, each and every application. So it's not a refrigerant specific. A refrigerant specific is only GWP, whereas TWI and LCCP is a system plus refrigerant put together. Now let's talk about uh, in some detail about the Kigali Amendment to Merge Protocol, wherein uh, HFC phase down was signed. Now, if uh, I don't know if you can see, if you see, this was the 28th meeting of parties uh, to the Monterey Protocol, and this was 14, uh, 10th to 14th October 2016 uh, in Kigali, Rwanda, where uh, this HFC phase down amendment was uh, signed. Now, this date is something important. Uh, we are signing a document in 2016, end of nearly end of the 2016, uh, where in um, we are talking of uh, a regulation uh, where uh, we will be working on HFCs and HFCs uh, are common in all the countries 
uh, in 2006 or were common in 2016. And even today, they are very common in all geographies. Now, let's look at this uh, table. This is about non-Article 5 countries. This non-Article 5 country is, is a terminology used in monitor protocol. So I'm just uh, using that terminology. If you, in layman term, ask me, then non-Article 5 is something which is uh, uh, developed countries, kind of. Now, these developed countries, again, there were two groups, uh, the main group and uh, the uh, subgroup or a different uh, group. So let's talk mainly about the main group and why we are talking about this main group is because a lot of the technology uh, what we get uh, or we partner with is with these uh, geographies. So US, Europe and all or Japan, they all part uh, are part of this non-article 5 main group. Now, if they are part of this uh, non-article 5 uh, main group, then we are going to see the technologies what we are getting uh, or we are working on uh, are getting influenced by these regulations. Now, uh, in 2016, uh, in uh, you know the world agreed for this phase down under Kigali under Montreal Protocol. Now, the baseline here is 2011, 12, and 13. Uh, average of these three. Now, average of these three means you know whatever was consumed in 11, 12, and 13. Um, uh, the main group knew or everyone knew because uh, even India knew what was consumption in uh, 11, 12, and 13 uh, because we were signing that in 2016. So we know the baseline, uh, majority of the baseline was already very rich in terms of uh, including very high GWP uh, HFCs. Uh, and then the protocol in 2016 uh, gave a couple of years, which is like three years for first step down uh, to 2019, and then uh, 24, 40%, and 29. So this 10% reduction is uh, probably already done, and uh, uh, 2024, 40% reduction is which is going to come. And you can see there is a five year gap in between these, which is uh, giving a good room for uh, developed countries to work on the alternative technologies, mature them and implement so that the 2024 uh, numbers can be achieved. Um, the schedule starts in 2019 and concludes at 2036, leaving 15%. So 85% gets phased down, leaving 15% uh, for uh, uh, the, uh, you know, which can continue to be there for a, a, a you know a lifetime, so a small amount or fifteen percent of this baseline will remain uh, kind of forever, uh, which can be used. Uh, this is graphical way of the same. I'm sorry, I'm emphasizing slightly more on this because this is important for us to understand from an environment perspective. What are the regulations and how uh, uh, they are going to impact us? Now uh, again. Uh, Article 5 countries are, uh, you know, the terminology used in Monitor Protocol. Now, Article 5 countries, uh, again, there are two groups, Group 1 and Group 2. We are part of the Group 2. This is part of the Group 2. Where are we? Uh, again, the, the signing was done in 2016. And now we are talking of 2024, 2025, and 2026. The baseline would be the average of these three uh, years. Uh, so which are future years, which uh, we have not even uh, reached uh, today. Now, if it is average of these three years, uh, and if you try to look upon this, uh, which is uh, 2024, 40% uh, gone for the uh, developed world, where our baseline uh, is going to impact. So probably, you know, I can be wrong. This is my personal, uh, uh, you know, evaluation is, the low hanging fruits which were available to the uh, non article 5 countries or the developed world may not be available for us as an industry uh, to work upon but the good part is we have a lot of time so we need to educate ourselves we need to train ourselves we need to start implementing and prioritizing uh, all these efforts so that we are able to meet the timelines the the challenge is if those low hanging fruits there are a lot of low hanging fruits uh, you know, if you switch uh, some uh, very high GWP refrigerants to alternates, then uh, you can meet uh, like 10% or uh, some, some uh, you know, initial requirement uh, of the phase down. 
Now, uh, in 2024 to 2026, uh, three years, we take average, calculates the baseline. In 2028, so from 26 to 28, uh, so unless, you know, we will probably get just one year to act. And in that, we need to do the calculation and we need to prepare for the freeze. Now, when we say prepare the, for the freeze, probably our first reduction is going to start here in 2028, not in uh, 32, where we are going to see a 10% reduction. Because in 2027, uh, we may have to come down to an average of these three years. So if I say if this were linearly growing, then we, in 2028, we need to come back to if we are growing and probably we are going to grow. Uh, in these years. So uh, from 2028, we need to go back to 2015 uh, consumption level. So probably our start of impact is going to be uh, very soon. So we need to prepare ourselves. Our uh, low hanging fruits may not be there. So we need to uh, prepare for it. And then um, uh, we will again have the similar pattern from 28 to 32 to uh, 37, 10%, 20%, 30%. And after 42 uh, to 47, we will have 85% uh, uh, reduction, which is, uh, sorry, so 85% reduction. So this is something which is going to be the substantial reduction and probably a lot of technologies would be available because uh, in 2042, uh, if you see here, 36, uh, their phase down completes. Whereas for us uh, in, uh, we would be at 20% or something, but we will get some room here to adopt those all these technologies, but our baseline would be smaller, probably. So that is where we need to be very cautious and uh, uh, start to take it uh, much, much uh, seriously. Uh, that was the graphical representation. This is about the baseline calculations, how the baselines are calculated. They are calculated based on the, I'm sorry, Just a second. So baselines are calculated based on the GWP. So when we know how much is the metric ton and we know how, what is the GWP of that molecule, based on that, we calculate the uh, baselines. So uh, is it going to impact only refrigerants? Uh, no, it is going to ref, uh, impact other applications along with refrigerants, but majority of the impact which are, we are going to get in India is on refrigerants because most of the forms are already going to hydrocarbon which will not be uh, coming into this so yes fire uh, there is fm200 or uh, 227 and some other uh, uh, fluorinated gases used in fire solvent propellant aging orc yes all of these applications would be impacted so this was about the uh, environmental regulations now if we move to the safety classification or the safety uh, we have in 2017, we uh, got this IS standard, Indian standard, which is IS 16656 uh, 2017, which is actually based on ISO 817 2014. Now, what this uh, uh, you know, standard talks about? This standard talks about uh, to establish a system to uniquely identify refrigerants and assign a reference number to refrigerants. So when we call 134A as 134A, not tetrafluoroethane. So uh, the nomenclature which gives us this number 134A from tetrafluoroethane is uh, in this first part of this standard, which I'm not covering today because we are going to talk about safety and other part. The other uh, part of this uh, standard is to establish the safety classification and refrigerant concentration limits. Now, these two are something which are important from a safety perspective. And these are something which I will try to uh, cover upon uh, in, in, in today's uh, talk in slightly more detail, sorry. So when we talk of safety classification, um, as of now, uh, the classification is class A or class B from toxicity perspective. Uh, when we say, you know, in layman term, yes, the, uh, by definition, it is the 400 ppm as the benchmark and uh, TLV, TWA is uh, threshold limit value at time weighted average. Uh, you know, essentially, you know, in layman terms, if we talk of if a person like an operator 
uh, who is exposed to a small amount of refrigerant always available in his work environment, then what is going to be the impact on that person, which is a long-term exposure kind of an impact, uh, is something which is done in this for classifying A versus B. So any refrigerant would be either classified A or B. So A means practically non-toxic. So, you know, a person can easily work and operate that system without, uh, you know, too much worrying about the toxicity. Uh, he may still need to worry about uh, a lot of other aspects, which I'm going to cover. But uh, from toxicity of the molecule perspective, he should not worry much. Uh, the worry uh, would be if he has a class B of refrigerant charged into the system. Now, class B is something where there would be a toxicity. Now, uh, I'm not saying that we can't use uh, a class B refrigerants. Yes, we can certainly use class B refrigerants. These are two different classifications, which gives us that if we are using class A, this is what we need to follow. And if we are using class B, then this is what we need to follow. So important for us to know is the classification and how to manage uh, that uh, toxicity uh, for use. So can we use a class B refrigerant in a room air conditioner like the uh, high wall split, which is running in my room? Probably not. Can we use a class A or class B uh, anyone in the chiller? Probably yes. So, you know, this depends upon what is the risk exposure and all that stuff. So that is defined in other standards, not in this standard. So let me uh, continue to focus on this standard and evaluate what are the safety aspects of the refrigerants. The another important thing is the flammability classification. Now, flammability is actually in this standard, it's classified into three, one, two, and three as a number. Uh, and 2L is part of 2, whereas nowadays the uh, new standard are coming up where this 2L becomes a separate uh, uh, classification. So we have four classification, 1, 2, 2L, and 3. Now, 1 means no flame propagation. In general condition at 60 degrees centigrade, there's not going to be any flame, uh, flame propagation. So we classify this as like non-flammable refrigerant. Uh, if there is some flame, but it is low, uh, a heat of combustion and less chances of uh, uh, getting into a flammable concentration where LFL, lower flammability limit, is um, uh, under uh, control or, you know, you need huge amount of more than 3.5% of uh, fuel or the refrigerant in air, then only it can ignite, then we call it two. Within the two, if the burning velocity is less than 10 centimeter per second, then we call it as 2L. Now, three is something which we considered as highly flammable. Now, highly flammable are something wherein even a very small percentage, which is less than 3.5% all LFL, LFL, it become uh, an ignitable uh, refrigerant and uh, it produces a lot of heat, which is more than uh, 19,000 uh, kilojoule per kg. So this makes it uh, important. Now, if we combine these a, B, and 1, 2, 3, and put that into the table, then this is how it looks like. So A, B, 1, 2, 3, and we have so many refrigerants as an example. So 1, 3, 4, A, 4, 10, A, all these refrigerants are part of this green A1. Now, this green A1 is something which we are very used to of using because we don't need to worry about the toxicity. We don't need to worry about the flammability, whereas the refrigerants nowadays coming up or the alternatives which are uh, where we are not able to find A1 kind of an alternative, uh, we may have to live with uh, A2L or B2 or, uh, uh, you know, B2L. So this is kind of the uh, scenario we are going to talk about towards the end of my charts about the alternative refrigerants and how they are uh, in this safety classification and other uh, aspects. But yes, uh, these refrigerants which we are seeing like 13440A, R32 as A2L, which we are already using. Propane is also used in India, which is, <coughs> sorry, A3 refrigerant. It's used in uh, room air conditioner and some commercial refrigeration. Now, when we go slightly in detail about the flammability, now there are two things uh, with the flammability. If you see uh, this line, uh, flammability evaluated by chance of flame and the effect of flame. The so chance of flame is how easy or difficult it is to ignite. Uh, that refrigerant if it leaks out from the system. And effect of the flame is if the refrigerant is already under the fire, then what is the consequence of that fire, uh, which we are going to see uh, if that catches the fire. So 
uh, these are the two important aspects. This chart, which we are seeing right now, uh, talks about the chance of the flame. So when we evaluate the chance of the flame, uh, we need to know what is the LFL, lower flammability limit. Now, uh, what is technically LFL? LFL is something which is, um, you know, what is the minimum amount of refrigerant or fuel need to be present in air when it can catch fire? So one, what is the minimum amount in percentage uh, of volume? And second, even if it is there, we need a chingari, we need a ignition source. So whether a very small static charge from our clothing or we need a lighter or a big, uh, you know, energy to ignite that uh, uh, flammable mixture is something which is there on this y-axis. So x-axis is the, uh, uh, you know, LFL or how much uh, is required to make it flammable mixture and then what minimum ignition energy is required to ignite that flammable mixture. So if we see towards the uh, bottom uh, of the left side is the highest risk where very small amount in air can ignite and very small ignition energy can or chingari can ignite that uh, mixture. So anything which is on the higher side uh, and on the right side is something which is still slightly acceptable. Now you may see uh, here propane uh, and uh, uh, 1234YF, which is uh, one of the alternate, but you may not see R32 here uh, because R32, the LFL, uh, is around 14%. So it's it's way out my screen. So I can't cover. If I put that across, then I would not be able to show this, uh, you know, stuff. So it is at the bottom, but uh, it is not in this, but it is still A2L. Now here, this is the chart, which is the effect of the flame. Now effect of the flame is something where if the refrigerant or this fuel catches fire, then it is going to flow and it is going to release energy. The amount of energy it is going to release is called the heat of combustion, which is on this y-axis. And how fast it flows is something which is there on this x-axis. Now here, uh, anything on the top right is something which is more dangerous. Whereas at this uh, bottom um, uh, left is something which is still manageable. So this is how uh, we can figure out which refrigerant uh, and what to do. The important uh, importance of this is, you know, if the burning velocity and heat of combustions are there, then we use or don't use that refrigerant for a particular application is something which makes it uh, essential for us to evaluate. This is the same chart in the table form. Um, the another aspect important, uh, which is, uh, the restriction on use or RCL, uh, so uh, which is part of this standard. Uh, so <coughs> what is RCL? RCL is the refrigerant concentration limit and is the minimum of these three. Acute toxicity exposure limit, which is a short-term exposure. So if there is a large release, then what's going to happen? then oxygen deprivation limit. Now, this is something which is important and let me try to focus here. If there is a refrigerant, which is like 134A, 410A, which are A1 refrigerant, so non-flammable, non-toxic. But if there is a room like, you know, the room where I sit in, in my uh, room, if the door is closed and the refrigerant leaks out, and if too much of the refrigerant leaks out, these refrigerants are heavier than air, they try to settle down and the oxygen is going to go up. So if the oxygen is going to reduce at the area where I'm breathing or in the room, the concentration, overall concentration of the oxygen is going to reduce because there is other gases which are now increased in the room, then we, I'm going to find a breathing problem, which is called as oxygen deprivation limit. And this oxygen deprivation limit uh, can lead to, hope you know, there are severe, you know, consequences, including the loss of life, if there is a oxygen deprivation. So, even the refrigerants, which we consider as non-toxic, we need to always consider for RCL, including oxygen deprivation limit, and I'm, I'm going to cover some of it uh, in later chart. Uh, the another third, another important aspect is the 
flammable concentration limit. Now, in the earlier chart, I talked about the LFL, which is from a technical evaluation when it ignites. But if it is there in the room, we take a factor of safety and we say that from LFL, only 20% is allowed to be considered as flammable concentration limit. So if the room is big enough and then and refrigerant leaks out, then it should not reach even the 20% of the LFL. So that's uh, what is considered for the RCL. So now if I take this as a, a chart, I'm sorry, probably you can't see this. So if this is from ASHRAE standard 34, where there is RCL of everything given here, this is PPM and then pond, and this is, which is the gram per meter cube. So meter cube is the volume and how much gram is something which is allowed uh, in that room. And what I have uh, highlighted here is 410A, which is a mixture, A1, which is non-toxic, non-flammable, but here uh, it is 140,000 PPM, which translate into 420 gram per meter cube. That means if there is a 420 gram per meter cube or more, then we should not let that refrigerant leak out into that room or we should not install the system uh, where there can be a refrigerant leak and we may have a oxygen deprivation or something. Now let's take an example of uh, say, this VRF kind of a system, I'm not going to talk about what a VRF is. Let's take, for example, there is a, a kind of a restaurant or some uh, area where there are multiple indoor units connected and there is a one restaurant manager's room, which is small where one ton of FCU is connected uh, or one ton of uh, ID indoor unit is connected to this large condensing unit of six ton. Now, if we need to calculate what would be the maximum charge which can be allowed in this six ton unit or this entire system, then we take this smallest room, not these larger rooms, the smallest room with 30 meter cube uh, with one ton, we calculate what would be the exposure. Now, if this 410A was the refrigerant, we know uh, 420 grams, so 0.42 uh, kg per meter cube and 30 meter cube as the uh, smallest room size. So we get 12.6 kg. Now this circuit, the entire circuit with all indoor units, with all outdoor unit piping and everything put together, we should not allow more than 12.6 kg of refrigerant. If we are doing so, and there is a leak in this room, the entire refrigerant leaks out into this room. And if there is a person sitting in this room, we have a problem. So as per this RCL, we need to calculate and do the safety evaluation of all sites where there can be a refrigerant exposure. This is just for the information. There can be a lot more detail about in, uh, you know, when you do the calculations and how you do the mitigation and all that stuff. But yes, this is important for us to know because this is already part of the Indian standard. Now we talk of blend. So, you know, we were using these refrigerants like, uh, you know, 12 or 22 and all that stuff for very long. Uh, why we need a blend is we need to move away from the current refrigerant. Say for example, uh, R22, if we need to move away uh, from R22, we need to uh, get into something uh, which replaces 22. We would love to have a single component, but if we are not able to find single pump component, then we try to balance out the properties by mixing the refrigerants. Now, when we say balance out the properties, let me give you an example of say 22 only. Now, 22 as a refrigerant uh, was very good, but because of the environmental or ODS, ozone depleting, we need to move away. So R32 is a good replacement of it, but R32 is flammable. Now, if we, you know, uh, I'm talking of those days when uh, this work was started in Japan, Europe, and other countries where 22 was, initially started to phase out 32 was or the industry was not ready to use 32 as a replacement of 22 uh, being flammable now if 32 is flammable we added kind of say 125 which uh, was also used as a fire extinguisher gas now if it is a fire extinguisher gas and we mix it with a mildly flammable refrigerant we make a mixture which is in total uh, a non-flammable refrigerant. So we get a blend 
which is a mixture of 32 and 125, 50-50%, which balance out the properties and gives us, uh, you know, an application where, uh, or the room air conditioning uh, refrigerant, where we can actually make a room air conditioner and use uh, and uh, replace R22. But if we try to do that, the, the entire system design need to be reworked because the, the pressure of 410A was much higher. So uh, there were small manufacturers who came back that, hey, we want to uh, you know, move away from 22 faster and uh, we don't find uh, 410A as at this point in time, uh, very uh, you know, impressive for us because we need to change all the lines, all the compressor, everything all the service tools and everything because of this higher pressure. So we want something where we can live with this smaller pressure or a regular pressure of R22. So there was a low pressure refrigerant which was available 134A. So 134A was added kind of. Uh, we got another refrigerant which we uh, nowadays call it as uh, 407C, which is a blend of 32, 125 and 134A. Now, this was matched so that we are able to get the performance very similar to what we are doing uh, with uh, 22. So that, a, you know, a small manufacturers who don't want to reinvest in the entire engineering, they can just choose the compressor and, <coughs> sorry, some of the components which are used, which are used for 22 or can be used for uh, 407C, but no major change, then they can quickly adapt to the HFC refrigerant. But then again, there was another set of the customer who said, hey, we have a big installation base, say, for example, uh, Indian Railway or something, uh, Not I'll not say Indian Railway uh, or, you know, the European Railways or something, where uh, they have huge population of the system. And for them to switch from 22 to, say, 407C, they need to change oil and do need to do a lot of retrofit uh, procedures. So they said, hey, can you give us something that we can use the same compressor? Then another uh, aspect was evaluated and there was a mild addition of uh, uh, the mineral oil, which is used in uh, 22, uh, so that we can, if we have a slight amount of uh, hydrocarbon, which does not make the blend uh, flammable, but can bring the oil back to the compressor. So we got uh, retrofit blends where there is a very small amount of uh, hydrocarbon, which brings the oil back and these are. So if we talk of one single refrigerant 22, and if we look for the number of options or the number of blends which came out for meeting specific requirements, we are starting with 32 to 410A to 407C, to ICON or say uh, 422 or 438 or these kind of refrigerants, which are retrofit refrigerants. So, you know, uh, as per the need, different, different refrigerants start to come. Now, if we uh, talk about the uh, chemistry or, you know, detailing about these, uh, not chemistry, but uh, from a pressure perspective, if we take two cylinders, mix them properly, not like uh, putting them into a small cylinder, but if we mix them, then generally the pressure of the mixture is going to be in between the pressure of a, a refrigerant and B refrigerant in journal. In some cases it can be different, but normally that is going to be the case. Now what happens if we take two refrigerants, and if we take two refrigerants whose boiling points are very different with each other and mix them 50-50. Um, if we mix them 50-50, say for example, I took one refrigerant which is having a boiling point of uh, minus 10 and another component which is having a boiling point of minus 30. If I put them together into this, uh, assume this as a cylinder, if I put that into this, uh, this was under vacuum. I put both the liquid as 50-50 ratio. There was a vapor which was available, vapor space which was available. Minus 30 boiling point component will try to boil faster and occupy more of this vapor space as compared to minus 10 component. Now this fractionation which is going to happen, which is majorly into the vapor phase because of the faster boiling of the lower boiling component is called the fractionation. And in blends, fractionation is something which is very important for us to know 
to deal with while we are handling the refrigerant or while we are handling the leaks or recovery of those systems uh, which are have charged with the blend. Now, if the percentage was 50-50 in the liquid, in vapor, it can be 80-20. Now, if we need to take out the gas uh, from this cylinder, in if uh, I don't know if you can see uh, this bottle clearly, but if I take it from the top, I'm going to get 80-20 ratio instead of 50-50. So I need to take it from the bottom. So I need to actually invert it and take it, or I need to use a dip tube to take it. There are some dip tube cylinders which are available in market where you can take from the bottom uh, of the cylinder. Now, that where we've talked about 80-20, there can be a refrigerant where uh, the boiling points were very close. Instead of minus 10 and minus 30, if we are talking of minus 18 to minus 22, then the fractionation is not going to be very high, like 80-20%. So it's going to be like 55, 45%. Now, the quantum of fractionation uh, is different for different blends. And that is what it is calculated by the glide. Now, what is glide? Glide is if I take the blend, put that into say a beaker, say 100 ml uh, into it, check for the boiling point at the start. Uh, so the lower boiling component is going to evaporate faster. So the boiling point will come down faster and then the boiling point is going to rise as that component loses out into the mixture. Now at the end of the boiling, there will be another boiling point. So the difference between this boiling point, this initial boiling point and the final boiling point is called as the temperature glide. Initial boiling point is when we see the first bubble. So it is also called as the bubble point. The last uh, drop when evaporates, you can also consider it as the first dew formed in the vapor is called the dew point. So the difference between the boiling point, uh, bubble point and the dew point is called as the temperature gland and the lower the temperature glide is better for us to deal with. Uh, why we are talking of the temperature uh, glide or the bubble point and the boiling point is because we, when we work on the system, we work on the two main things in the system for evaluation of charge or system properties or anything, which is one is the superheat and second is the subcool. Now, when we are looking at the tables, uh, say for example, for 22, you'll get at any temperature, you'll get just one saturation temperature for at any pressure, you'll get just one saturation temperature. So you can use it for calculating superheat and you can use the same temperature for subcool. Whereas <coughs> for blends, uh, for every pressure, there are going to be the two different temperatures. One will be the bubble point available, one will be the dew point available. Now for superheat calculation, you need to use the dew point. And for subcool calculation, you need to use the bubble point. If you use the wrong, you're going to have a challenge in the system because instead of a five degree super subcooling, you may be getting, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, zero or one degree uh, subcooling. If you choose, the another the dew point so that is something which is important for us to know now when the fractionation happens we know about the temperature glide uh, we know superheat and subcool calculations that we need to use dew point and bubble point for what and then uh, if we talk of sorry so how they impact um, when there is a leak in the system and it is charged with the blend and we don't know where is the leak. Then we don't know how much is which component leaked out. So in some cases, uh, OEM recommends to change the entire gas. So you need to take, uh, you know, definitely agree on what OEM is saying because they have designed the system and they know how to deal best with the system. Uh, so that is important. Second is to transfer. So when you're transferring, you need to always take liquid from the cylinder never take bottom uh, never take the vapor from the cylinder and charging while charging if you're taking liquid and you need to charge it onto the vapor side always try to expand by using a you know a a orifice or a uh, some components which are available in market for charging liquid to the suction side so that they not uh, freeze uh, the compressor some of the uh, other refrigerant properties uh, we have uh, refrigeration capacity. So at the compressor suction, refrigeration capacity is important. The larger, the better. 
operating pressures we always want higher pressure uh, means positive pressure of the evaporator and lower condensing pressure so that the uh, overall cost of the system comes down it should be miscible with the oil so that it brings back the oil to the compressor uh, it should be chemically stable should have good thermal conductivity lower discharge temperature because if there is a discharge temperature which is higher then we have disintegration of oil and elastomers at the compressor discharge and dielectric properties are also important in terms uh, when we are using a hermetically sealed compressor then we need to look for the dielectric properties because the same refrigerant is cooling uh, uh, the motor as well uh, the alternative refrigerants now when we talk of alternative refrigerants this is something which I have taken out from AHRI uh, a study. And this is what you see 134A as taken as the baseline. And when we try to evaluate, these are the number of the options which AHRI uh, was working on. These are categorized into three. The green color is something which is A1, so non-toxic, non-flammable. Then yellow, which is uh, 2L, which is mildly flammable. And A3, which is uh, highly flammable. Now. Uh, we have options uh, from uh, 134A, which is GWP of around 1300. We can come down to 600 or 500 or something uh, by keeping A1 category. But if we need to go further down, then we need to go to A2L or A3. Uh, then only we can achieve a very low GWP mark. 404A, which is around 4000 GWP. Uh, if we need to remain in A1, non-toxic, non-flammable, we can come to around 1200, 1300 kind of a GWP. Uh, but if we need to further go down to 100, 200, then we need to go to A2L. And if we need to further go down, uh, then we need to use a hydrocarbon, so highly flammable A3 refrigerants. I'm skipping some of these charts. Yeah. So if we talk of 22 alternative, uh, you know, 22 if you see around 1800 GWP, A1 is around similar or around 900 or 1000, so not much difference. Uh, A2L also, there are only a couple of it which are being worked out, which may uh, be suitable, but most of it is moving to other uh, applications. Uh, this is A3, which is um, uh, hydrocarbons, and there is also B2L, which is... Uh, uh, ammonia, which can be used only into refrigeration applications. 410A, which is now majorly used as refrigerant in uh, room air conditioning and uh, overall air conditioning. Most of it is A2L, means uh, there is only one, which is A1, which is uh, carbon dioxide, which can be used only in some uh, temperature or low temperature applications. But for all other room air conditioner or uh, applications for 410A, the alternatives are A2L. So we need to learn to deal with flippable refrigerants. Uh, we can't, uh, you know, uh, live without uh, working with flammable refrigerants in future. So we need to equip our teams. We need to uh, gain knowledge, gain experience, start to work on flammable refrigerants, A2L or A3. But yes, in future, we would be needing to work on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are my contact details. So let me quickly see if there is any question which I can answer. So, right. So give me a second. Let me go back to, boom, yeah. I'm sorry. So there are four open questions. Uh, should I read it? Uh, should I read it, sir, or you will take it? I, I can read it. <laughs> okay. Why the world has uh, not put a stress and invested on R&D for the use of uh, abundantly available cheaper ammonia nature refrigerant and very less uh, total equivalent warming impact? Um, what is the latest HVAC system with ammonia as a refrigerant? So ammonia, uh, I I don't agree with this that uh, not much invested in R&D. Probably ammonia is one of the oldest refrigerant and you, it is very common today also. So uh, it's a very, very uh, common refrigerant. And uh, yes, uh, since it is B2L, 
so mildly flammable and uh, slightly toxic or toxic. Uh, so in the occupied uh, room, say for example, in my room where I am working. So as of now, the technologies are not there uh, to use uh, ammonia. But uh, yes, people are working on low charge size ammonia and all. So uh, ammonia is very common refrigerant and uh, probably in, in future, the, the applications uh, of using ammonia are continuing to going to improve and uh, increase. So yes, uh, the next question is from Mr. Neeraj Kumar. What kind of refrigerant is being used in green cooling nowadays? And now this is green cooling is something which is very subjective. So um, life cycle climate performance is uh, the important tool which is used nowadays to evaluate. So in certain application, a one refrigerant which is having a GWP of one versus GWP of 20, if uh, the 20 gives overall climate benefit, then that can be used. But yes, there are huge, huge list of refrigerants which are being evaluated and used for multiple applications. So uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific answer. If you ask me one application, uh, then probably I can try to pull down two, three at least uh, uh, refrigerants which can be used. Uh, but uh, there's no single uh, answer. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, can I get recording of this in webinar? So that is the question to uh, Delhi chapter of Vishray. Uh, if uh, they can share. Uh, then again, uh, Mr. Amit Kumar Mittal, there is another question. Uh, why are we still not uh, comparing uh, refrigerants on? Um, I am not sure uh, why are not uh, still not comparing refrigerant. Uh, what is your reference? So how you got this impression of uh, that uh, TWI is not uh, being evaluated. So probably industry have uh, migrated or improved from only TWI to life cycle climate performance and all the applications are evaluated in my knowledge. I know of automotive, a lot of commercial refrigeration, a lot of chillers being evaluated on first with TWI, then with life cycle climate performance. So yes, this is being used. So um, I'm not sure uh, what's your experience in terms of uh, evaluation. But yes, if you need uh, more of details, probably you can connect me offline. I can share some of the examples where uh, people have done the evaluation of these. Uh, is the recording available on YouTube channel of Ishra Daily Chapter? If not, please share the recording. Okay, again, uh, to DCI. Uh, disposing of refrigerant is going to be the big challenge. Uh, how are we going to address it? Uh, Agarwal Saab, I agree. Uh, and uh, probably, uh, you know, I, as a couple single who is working in this industry uh, on uh, refrigerant, uh, you know, uh, handling and refrigerant, uh, other stuff. So we are trying to uh, find out how to uh, work on the solution. But as of now, uh, we are having this gap. Uh, we don't have, uh, you know, reclaim and disposable uh, disposing facilities in India, uh, which we need uh, right now. So uh but as of now yes uh, we don't have that uh, but yes ministry of environment uh, you are in uh, touch with them they are working they are evaluating and a lot of enterprises are also trying to evaluate but it's uh, you know hamariya raddi bech ke bhi we expect some money to come back from raddi versus the refrigerant gases when we are going to uh, give this refrigerant gases uh, for dispose of the person or the entity who is giving will have to actually pay. Uh, the last experience was, uh, you know, when there was good amount of uh, amount paid for disposing of these refrigerants in India in cement, uh, cement clean. So, but yes, uh, that is something which is still open and uh, we need to work on it. Any specific refrigerant uh, according to any specific refrigerant according to climate? Okay, so uh, I, I talked about all of these. Uh, from referring different uh, aspects of climate, ozone versus uh, uh, global warming. Uh, uh, Vipin Baujaji, what are the uh, safety precautions for 290 and 600 day while handling? Oh, yes, so we uh, you know do uh, specific programs on safety uh, of reference, which are in detail, where we also talk about uh, 290 and 600 day and 
uh, A2L refrigerants like R32, how to handle whether we can use the same vacuum pump or not, or uh, you know how to charge and all that stuff. So probably you can join some of our session, which we are working on this. Otherwise, there is also one of the Ishray guideline, which is available on the safe and responsible use of refrigerants. So you can probably download that uh, from the Ishray uh, website. Fine, with this, uh, I win. Oh. When, okay, while instead of while handling, uh, when handling, fine, fine, fine. So uh, I, over to you, uh, DCI, probably I try so, to- uh, I have one, one last question for you, uh, uh, Singhal sir. Uh, yes, to sir. find out from you, what do you see uh, uh, as the future for water as a refrigerant? Because it has, you know, from a perspective of global warming, it has a GWP of zero. So how do you see water as a refrigerant in the coming time? So water is already used in refrigerant and uh, it's used in re as refrigerant in two uh, applications, which I know. One, it is in uh, one of, uh, you know, some of the vapor absorption systems and second in the steam jet refrigeration. So steam jet refrigeration is where we have high capacity, uh, like uh, say thermal power plants and all, where we have a good amount of steam, uh, which is available. So we use uh, water as a refrigerant. It used to be used in some of the uh, hotel industry also, which is uh, not much common now. But yes, uh, uh, water, again, being natural, uh, we have potential for it. There are certain limitations, but yes, there are certain applications where those limitations can be easily managed. For some, it would be difficult to manage, um, or we may need more experience uh, to manage, but yes, uh, the work is still going on to increase the number of applications for uh, water as well. Fabulous, fabulous session, Kapilji. Thank you very much. And I think we have all the questions, and we are right on time. Um, uh, so um, the uh, the it's I think. Just the best way to kick off our environment uh, week. Yeah, uh, uh, Priyank, sorry. Uh, so probably uh, DCI need to answer about uh, the recording, whether it would be available uh, yeah, yeah. on some site or something. Yes, Where sir. Uh, recording is available with view too. So uh, regarding the PPTs and all, uh, it's up to our committee member. If they allow us, uh, then we can say. So right now we can answer for that PPT regarding. But oh, yes, I recording is available with... Yeah. I think Kappas will simply be available in our digital library. Uh, this presentation should be put up on in our digital library at the uh, Ishray uh, DCI website. And I'm sure somebody who's a DCI member will be easily able to access it. Is that right? Yeah, I think YouTube will be the best option to look out this. Uh, I think uh, I, I have so, requested everybody to subscribe our channel as well. So uh, yeah. they will get the notification for the upcoming uh, seminars or programs as well. Sure. So I think this should be available both on our digital library at, at our at, on our website and all on the YouTube channel. So I think we'll encourage you to become DCI members. Uh, I think members are our strength and uh, we look forward. Uh, and I think we have a lot of exciting programs coming up in the next couple of days. So sorry, Priyank, to interrupt you. Please go. No, no, nothing at all, sir. Uh, only I was saying uh, this whole week has been uh, championed with the uh, DCI team, uh, very ably led by our very energetic and dynamic President, Mr. K.D. Singh. And uh, I, without further ado, I would uh, like to invite him to uh, uh, deliver the vote of thanks for the first program of the Environment Week for DCI. Uh, thank you, uh, Priyangji. And uh, my first, my heart goes out to thank uh, Mr. Kapil Singhal for having taken out uh, this time for his wonderful presentation. And uh, as I was, uh, you know, looking through the uh, attendees list, I found there a lot of international, uh, you know, people who had come in to attend this webinar. And I think one of the comments in the chat box was from a gentleman from the Turkish chapter of Ash Ashray. So that speaks about the speaker and that speak speaks about the depth of uh, the knowledge that you have and uh, the kind of topic that was, you know, that you chose to pick up and speak. So uh, and there's a lot of lot of very good people on this uh, on the participant list who have you know very patiently listened to this wonderful presentation. I think it was a great start to the environment week, and uh, we really thank you for having paid time. It was a great uh, presentation that you made. I think uh, all of us who go back from here 
uh, will believe that we invested a lack a, a, a day or a, a hour you know in a day which uh, is really has uh, you know help us to grow intellectually and be wiser people in terms of the refrigerants that we need to use and how we can conserve and preserve the environment so i thank you very much firstly for uh, being here and look forward to more sessions from you from where our members can benefit i would also thank dci uh, you know all the uh, the admin staff of dci who put in all this effort to put this uh, you know get this environment week together to put this together and uh, you know and i would thank all my panelists who are here today and all the attendees who are here today especially the attendees who found time to be here and be on this program i think a big thank you to you it's a great uh, you know your presence actually gives us a lot of motivation to do more programs like these and uh, you know we we believe that yes we are bringing value to our members and uh, you know that encourages us to do more and more and let me assure you that uh, shortly we'll be coming up with a lot of international speakers uh, we already have confirmations from them in the coming month uh, maybe in the month of july we'll have some wonderful topics and some international speakers on on the dci platform so uh, 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 we we look for we look forward to your support and look forward uh, that you can get us more members uh, you know membership is members are our strength and uh, we look forward to more members and we look forward to more interaction from you we request that somebody who is uh, you know who is knowledgeable on any subject that you know you can speak like you to come forward share knowledge on our platform we'd be delighted and excited to have you as one of our speakers so uh, and thank you all our sponsors uh, who are here and who have actually sponsored or helped us in these difficult times so uh, i think with these uh, words i thank each one of you everybody especially kapil singhal sir for have been being here uh to priyank ji who is uh, uh, i think one of the most brilliant persons in this industry a uh, graduate from iit and then from stanford speaks for itself and uh, so thank you very much each one of you and thank you everybody thank you all of you for being here so this will be available on our website this entire presentation it will also be available on our youtube channel i think it's a great presentation for everybody to, to go over again and again and to you know to understand more and to take it forward so thank you very much thank you uh, from dci we are really indebted to all of you and thank you very much for your participation thank you thank you sir thank you kd singh ji thank you kapil ji we i counted a maximum of 55 participants at one time attending attendees apart from the panelists and on the chat box uh, we have just published the link for tomorrow's session please register in advance join us again tomorrow as we continue the world environment week activities at dci um it's a, a great opportunity and we started uh, 502 and we are going to end at 632 so within 2 minutes of our commitment time so thank you very much to our speakers both the inaugural as well as the uh, main speakers to keep us right on the clock and uh, demonstrate punctuality thank you everybody have a great evening and see you again tomorrow